Yeah. Hello. There's a Tesla man watching me. It's the first time I've ever charged a Tesla. Like I say, it's a touch of a button here. You can even use the <laughs> sake. Well, hey guys, it's Joel. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to this, the 2024 Tesla Model 3. And today I'm going to give you my brutally honest opinion on it. Now, believe it or not, the Tesla Model 3 has actually been around a good seven years now. It first launched in the US in 2017. But despite that, I've never actually, well, even sat in one, let alone driven one. But this week, thanks to Tesla Press, I have been the custodian of this latest generation Model 3, and I've been living with it as my sole daily driver. And it's been a really, really interesting experience, which we'll get into later on in the video. But very quickly, for those of you that are familiar with the Model 3, but not necessarily this newest model, we'll just talk quickly about the changes. So the design on the outside is slightly different. It all looks a little bit sleeker, actually. If you were to put this next to an old Model 3, you can and tell it apart and this newer model does look like the more contemporary modern more grown-up version the headlights have been redesigned they're a much sleeker design now and at the back the rear lights are too there's a few new wheel options available these ones are actually the optional i think they're 1500 pound 19 inch wheels and i have to say it does look very smart also, this particular car is specced with the ultra red paintwork, which is a £2,000 option. And I have to say, it's, it is a good looking car. This particular model is the entry level rear wheel drive model. So it comes in at just under £40,000. And one thing I do like about Tesla is just like the car itself, its model lineup and pricing strategy is all very streamlined. So this one, in fact, is the entry level rear wheel drive model, which comes in at just under £40,000. Then the next one up is the long range, which comes in at £50,000. And then the performance thereafter is £60,000. Very, very simple. This being the rear wheel drive, it has the smallest battery of the lineup. It's only 58 kilowatts, which is pretty small for a car of its size. In the long range of the performance, you get a dual motor, which is bigger and capable of more range in both. But obviously it takes a little bit longer to charge up. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. This car then being the rear wheel drive has a quoted range of 318 miles, a 0 to 60 of 5.8 seconds and a top speed of 125. Now, if you upgrade and spend the extra 10 grand to get the long range, you get a larger battery, which supposedly gives you 390 miles of range, a slightly improved 0 to 60 time and the same top speed. And then you have the ludicrous performance car, which does 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds, has a top speed of over 160 and does a range of about 328 miles. On paper, at least, I'd say it looks like the long range is the best of the three in terms of value range and all the rest of it. But obviously, because it's a bigger battery, it will take longer to charge than this one. So with the battery sizes, if you have a home charger, a 7.3 kilowatt charger, this rear wheel drive will fully charge in about nine hours, whereas the longer range with a larger battery, more like 12. So there's a bit of a difference there, but both I would say you can feasibly do overnight. But when I picked this up from Tesla, I was handed this very unceremonious looking card and it turns out well this is the key but actually this is more of a backup key because the key for the tesla is within an app on your phone it's the tesla app and this is essentially how you're going to lock the car unlock the car and control various other things like opening the charging port. You can also open both of the boots. Of course, there's one at the front too from this app, but there's other funky features like being able to beep the horn, which I suppose if you've parked the car and forgotten where it's been put, that's kind of handy. You can open the windows a little bit to vent it out. And obviously this is not a new thing, being able to control functions of your car from an app, but it is very, very seamless on here. Things like being able to set the climate control before you get in the car is really really nice and with it being electric it happens very very quickly but i have to admit i felt slightly out of my depth this week with this car most of the stuff that you see on the channel that i review tends to be older but certainly all the cars that i own even now and have owned have all been older as well so this is a little bit of a baptism of fire having this as my only car for the week when i've never even experienced a tesla and a few of those things like the app have taken a little bit of time getting used to I'd still prefer to have a key fob, but I will admit that it all works very well. So if you are anything like me and you have limited EV experience, perhaps you've never owned one and 
tends to sway more towards things with a combustion engine that sound godly and smell of petrol. Well, stay tuned because I have found this experience with this car very, very eye-opening indeed. And I think there's a lot of really interesting things we can talk about, especially when we jump inside, that will interest even the most die-hard petrol heads amongst yourselves, because it certainly has intrigued me. So let's jump inside the car, because I think that's where all the magic really happens with this Tesla. Right, so, I must admit, when I first stepped inside this Model 3, I was quite surprised and shocked in a number of ways. The first thing that struck me is due to my predispositions about what Teslas were like without any experience particularly, it feels really, really premium and quite luxurious in here. And I wasn't expecting that. I've heard things all about build quality and well, lack thereof with Teslas, but you do not get that impression amongst first stepping into the car whatsoever. And then the other thing that's really surprising if you're not used to a Tesla is just the lack of stuff in here. It is extremely, extremely minimalistic, more so than any other car that I've experienced. Of course, there are no dials in front of you and you just see straight down to the bonnet, which of course allows for a really good view of the road. And of course now there are no stalks, whereas there used to be stalks before for the gearing and the indicators and things like that, they're gone. So that means that now our indicators are a button on the wheel. In fact, the only other buttons in here that I can find are on the seat because thankfully we still have actual buttons to adjust our seat position. And then there's a button here to open the door and that's the same on all of the doors. That works really nicely and it just means that it's not cluttered with anything, even things like door handles and it just creates this extremely relaxing space. Down here we have this large storage cubby which you could definitely fit a couple of meal deals in. Then two generously sized cup holders. In fact, here's a normal bottle of water. That goes in there, absolutely no problem. You can cover them up with this slat here and I have to say this finish is quite nice it doesn't scratch too much it's sort of a grey metallic-y finish and feels really good and this one slide over to reveal a 12 volt socket and yet another large storage compartment above that you have this double wireless charging pad which is lined in this felt material and feels and looks very premium too and then the stitching all around the car looks to be pretty good quality and actually everything you touch also feels like good quality. These seats are very, very comfortable and the leather feels very expensive. Not only that, they're now ventilated as well as heated. And there's a lot of things that come as standard with this car, which we'll get onto very shortly. Of course, you now have this dual acoustic glass all the way from the front to the back of the car which I have to say I really, really like. You don't really benefit from it in the driver's seat because where the glass starts is above your usual eye line when you're driving, but certainly in the back, you're aware of it. And it's nice to gaze up through at night, that's for sure. The headliner feels cheap, to be honest. It's one of the few things that does feel a little bit cheap in here. Also flexing a little bit, not particularly well secured. But in terms of things that you interact with, like the wheel, the seats, and the screen, which we'll get onto very shortly, it does feel well made and like a nice place to be. So let's finally move on then to the centerpiece, the command center of the Tesla Model 3. It's this gargantuan screen and it dominates the interior. Now I have to admit, when I first stepped inside this car, I was totally perplexed and actually completely overwhelmed because I just initially thought, how on earth am I going to drive it? Uh, there's no, rotary selector or gear shift knob here. Of course, it's an electric car, so I thought, okay, that's kind of normal. But then there's nothing here to put it into drive. But like anything, it's easy once you know how. So as long as the key is on here or the phone is connected via the app, you just pop your foot on the brake and you slide here for drive or reverse and you're away. There is actually an alternate way to do that though, which is up here. There's a control panel on the overhead and you can press it once and then you can select drive neutral or reverse or park. Uh, something good to know, I suppose. But then we tap over here to access our map and this uses Google Maps because there's actually no way of using Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in the Tesla. It relies all on its own system. Now I will say I miss using Waze. I do use Waze generally in my cars, uh, but this essentially, if you're used to using Google Maps, is the same 
thing. Now, just very quickly on charging, this entry-level rear-wheel drive model will charge up to 170 kilowatts an hour, which, with the size of this battery, from 10 to 80% should only take about 20 minutes if you can find a supercharger. With the long range and the performance, the charging capability is a little bit higher at 250 kilowatts an hour, but of course, you're charging a bigger battery. So the difference in terms of time per mile is kind of negligible, as long as you can find the highest rate of charge at a charger. But I did do a journey the other day, which was to Oxfordshire and back. It's about 220 miles. Now, when I fully charge this car at home overnight, it tells me 100% 244 miles of range, which you'll see is noticeably less than the 318 miles that it quotes. However, I did 180 or something miles in the end that day, and I came back with about 100 miles of range, meaning that it sort of added 30 or 40 miles to what it quoted me in the morning. So basically, if I'd kept going, I would have ultimately got about 275, 280 miles that day, which I think is pretty good because that is quite close to the 318 mile range that they they quote it's pretty accurate if not slightly underestimates how far you're gonna be able to go and that is the way it should be certainly with an electric car now by pressing here where it has a temperature it brings up the air conditioning control panel and yes it's always going to be more of a faff using a touch screen for this sort of thing than if you just had dials and buttons below however i will be honest and say that this screen this infotainment system this ipad is the most responsive of any touchscreen system in any car that I've ever reviewed before. And I mean that, I mean, the latest Jaguar Land Rover, the latest Range Rover has this really sort of lethargic screen, certainly in comparison to this. Whereas actually tapping on here and activating your cooled seat or your climate control where you want it to go, yes, it takes your eyes off the road, but it is so unbelievably responsive that you're not having to do double takes and re-tap things. And, Basically, when you press things, they work the first time, which is good. And yes, as I said, this thing has heated and cooled seats as standard. In the rear, you've got heated seats as well, which is, I just think, mighty impressive for a car that's £40,000. All of this stuff is standard. And not only that, and I didn't realise this until a little bit later on in the week, I've got a heated steering wheel. I think for forty grand, that is very, very impressive indeed. Next to the air conditioning controls, there's a car icon. Now, if we click on that, that essentially is our menu for almost everything to do with the car. So no light switches, that's in here. They're just on auto. And to be honest with you, I've never had to touch that. If you wanna open the glove box, that's done through here and it snaps back manually in a very satisfying fashion. The wipers are automatic. You can activate them by pressing this button on the wheel. I found that they're not quite as sensitive in automatic mode as I would like, so it will leave quite a lot of droplets on the windscreen before it swipes again. So you can put it in a manual mode like that, but obviously I don't want to be faffing about in here. I just want the automatic mode to do its job properly, but it's a little bit too unresponsive for my liking. Dynamics then, not much to do on this rear wheel drive. I know that on the performance, you can enter track mode. All we have in this rear wheel drive model is acceleration mode, either chill or standard. I've left it in standard. Chill, I would say, probably limits the power by about half, but I do find it's very easy to modulate the throttle. It's very well judged, this throttle pedal actually, and so I've never found the need to put it in chill. I'm not finding that I'm accidentally over accelerating it's quite easy to judge that and i just prefer having all the power available for say a motorway slip road should i need it steering weight light standard and heavy i've left it in light that's how i've enjoyed driving it i find that it naturally weights up anyway as you get faster and actually we'll talk about it in a little bit but when you start pushing on down a country road say with lots of twisties it weights up quite nicely even in light mode there's a screen here for charging which obviously tells us our current battery state. So right now, 223 miles of range at 91%. So yeah, far cry off the 318 miles that we should have at 100%. But as I said, in these sort of summary conditions, I've been getting or would get about 270 to 280 miles. So, you know, pretty close. And, you know, that is a decent amount of range. 
then autopilot. So this is the entry level system. It's not too dissimilar to a car that will just have adaptive cruise control and lane assist or the one that helps you sort of keep it in lane. That's basically what this is. There's a few extra things like, you know, if you indicate it will change lanes for you. There is an upgradable software. You can have the full autopilot. It's something like 7,000 pounds, but I don't believe that that's legal in the UK yet. So essentially you can buy this car without any of the additional extra autopilot. And should that become legal, you can just go to Tesla, you can pay your £7,000 retrospectively and they just do a software update for you and voila, you've got the upgraded autopilot system. We'll talk about it when we drive the car, but I found initially it quite difficult to get along with. However, I've worked a few things out that do make it better. And then another thing I think is quite cool about this whole digitalization thing is on here, on the service tab, we can go and open up the owner's manual. Now that's something many cars I've bought is missing or it's something that will be in paper in a booklet somewhere stowed away in the glove box and you have to dig it out. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but I do quite like the fact that the owner's manual is in the car. There's all sorts of instructionals here about adjusting your seat, steering wheel, the mirrors and stuff I just talked about. So if you are stuck, you can go in here and find that information. I think that's quite nice. That's more or less it when it comes to just the menus, but there are a few other things I, I want to show you if I may in here. So very quickly, if you want to listen to the radio, that's fine. You just click in here, you choose a radio station and you can turn it down or up with this slidey thing here. If you don't want to do that, you can do it on the wheel using the left hand scroll wheel to turn the thing up or down. That's quite intuitive once you get used to it. Likewise, if you want to skip a radio station or a track on your Spotify, for example, you just flick across like this using the same wheel. Despite there being no Apple CarPlay, you have Spotify on here, which you can just connect your account to. And then you can listen to as much Sleep Token or Ramstein as you want to all day long as you normally would. Then by clicking these three dots here, you can see the other array of apps that you have. So for example, you can control the rear display in the back of the car. So if I want the children in the back to have their heated seats on, I can do it here. Or if I can hear them watching something they shouldn't be doing, I can also change in the theater mode in the back of the screen what they're watching here. And in the toy box tab, there's all sorts of kind of gimmicky things that you can do maybe once to show your family and have a laugh like the light show. And then there's this particularly useful one called emissions, which if you press this button here, does that. I have to say, my father and I did find that absolutely hilarious the first time we tried it. <laughs> my favorite thing of all on here though is the theater mode. So if you go in here, you've got Netflix, Disney Plus, YouTube, Tesla tutorials and Twitch. Now you can literally go into YouTube. Here we go, look, there's a review of the Tesla Model 3. We can literally click on that and go full screen, just like we're sat at home watching it on the telly. I mean, the resolution too is really, really mighty impressive. But you might think, well, when on earth would I actually use this? And one example I could think of is we get the ferry to the Isle of Wight fairly regularly and often sit in the car for half an hour. So you can watch your favorite Netflix show or YouTuber while sat in the traffic. And in fact, there is quite literally a web browser. So you can go in here, go onto browser, and you can literally search the web. Tesla Model 3, click on that. We can literally go in here onto the Tesla website and configure our Tesla Model 3 from our Tesla Model 3. I'm quite impressed, I have to say. Let's very quickly have a look in the back because it's also quite nice back there. And then we'll go for a drive and we'll find out if potentially that's where this car falls down a little bit. So in the back of the Tesla Model 3 then, and as I mentioned, initially the first thing you're gonna see is this glass overhead panel, which is really nice. I really love being able to see the stars at night and things like that. You do get a fantastic view from the back. And also just like the front, you don't really feel like there's a quality dip back here at all. The seats again, feel really good. The handles here are extremely soft. We also in the back, like the front, and I didn't mention it, have double glazing windows, which means that this car is super, super quiet. There's a little hook here where if you wanna hang your jacket, we've got two spotlights, which you can just turn off by tapping like so. There's a nice armrest uh, with a couple of cup holders in it. Also feels of good quality. The back of the seats as well are plastic, but they don't look it into the touch. They don't feel too cheap. 
got good seat pockets which sort of extend elastically which is nice and really i mean there's not any complaints back here from me but again the centerpiece like in the front with the back of this model 3 is this screen now this is new to the latest model and it's just like the front one albeit a little bit smaller but there is a lot we can do back here such as watching youtube again and this works independently of the front so you can have people in the back watching rory reed talk about the new 911 whilst you're driving along and you've got your of course air conditioning your heated seats that you can control from back here too and if you want to you can play games which i just think is crazy now one thing i can believe that this car had which i've only ever had personally in my v12 7 series a car that cost well about 100 grand new and this is something you would really only find in executive cars the ability on the passenger side to move forward the front seat so you can literally travel in this thing as if you're an executive this will go a long way forwards as you can see when there's no one sat in that seat and the leg room you get over there is quite impressive to be honest but even on this side with this seat in my driving position as you can see if i sit normally it's ex i mean it is it is very impressive I, I i have to admit it the knee room is sublime you're slightly raked sat in the back here you're slightly angled up i'd say but i think they improved this over the previous generation and it is yeah superbly comfortable there's no uh, adjustment on the seats per se other than being able to move that one forwards but yeah with this in my driving position and i'm about five foot nine five foot ten there's absolutely plenty of room back here if i was a kid now growing up and my mother or my father had this car and this is what i got to sat in the back back of I, I would absolutely i mean i would be beside myself i remember when i was about seven years old my dad got a toyota avensis but it was the cdx and that had this tiny black and white 2d pixelated sat nav screen in it i mean it can't have been much bigger than my watch and i just remember thinking that was the best thing since sliced bread so yeah i mean i would have a full-on heart attack if i was a seven-year-old now and this is what was in the back of my parents car i mean it's just utterly impressive to be honest with you and i know so far i'm absolutely loving this car and i have not really had a bad thing to say about it to be honest and i know a few of you might be a bit crossed by that because you're not a fan of evs but i mean when they're this good it makes no sense to have that sort of prejudice because this thing is just remarkably impressive especially when you consider the price point of it all right so driving the tesla model 3 then and first impressions are just how unbelievably quiet it is in this car as i mentioned the model 3 now has acoustic glass all round. i believe it's double glazed if you actually look at the windows it's super duper thick this along the top is acoustic as well and they've done a lot in this newer generation to improve the noise because i think it was a complaint amongst a few with the outgoing model 3 but honestly this is right up there with the likes of the brand new range rover or the latest l460 model it is just so so quiet in here i was also initially pleasantly surprised at the ride quality i didn't really know what to expect but i can report that it is well pretty soft actually it's a very very comfortable ride on speed bumps i find it's fairly good as well you don't really have to slow down for speed bumps all that much and it's just all in all quite impressive actually and i don't really have any complaints in that department as we build up the speed a little bit we're at 70 miles per hour now the noise still in the cabin is pretty pretty low we can hear some tire rumble as to be expected and some wind noise but really for other cars i've driven like this it's much better and i can only think of cars that have a six-figure price tag that are as civilized refined and quiet to drive as this whilst we're on the dual carriageway here on the a3 i'll just quickly demonstrate to you what we have in terms of autopilot so i'm just going to engage it by double tapping this wheel on the right hand side so double tap there we go the blue lines come on here to show that we're being kept in our lane and i'll set this to a max of 70 miles an hour which is our adaptive cruise control now initially when i first used this autopilot system i was a little bit underwhelmed because it 
didn't seem as advanced as I was expecting it to be. Now, I know this is the basic autopilot, but even still, I felt that it was, even for an adaptive cruise control system, very back and forth, very jumpy, very lurchy. And I felt that it followed the cars too closely, a bit like right now. And I went for ages through this menu, trying to find autopilot, dynamics, trying to find a way of adjusting that until I realized it's right here on the steering wheel. So using this knob, if I flick it left, we can increase our distance from the car in front, from two car lengths all the way to seven. And I found once I put it all the way down to seven, it keeps a good enough distance and then the adjustments on the pedal for accelerating or braking are far less severe and, and more smooth. And for sitting in traffic, it's really quite pleasant actually, because it does the steering for you as you would expect, but it does quite a nice job at, at keeping a good distance and not sort of reacting too much to the car in front, because that can be an issue with adaptive cruise control at times when it's just way too reactive. But even when you take it out of autopilot, cruise control mode, all of that good stuff, it's still a really effortless car to drive. When you get to a roundabout, you have a little bit of a faff about where your indicators are, especially when you're turning the wheel. You can't always know which one is right and which one is left because the wheel's sometimes upside down. And I've still not quite gotten used to those indicators. I've found myself you know, going round and round about indicating right, and then when your exit comes up, you indicate left, or at least you try to, but the wheel's upside down, so you can't find it. I suppose with more time, you might get a bit more used to that, but yes, I quite like, you know, if they're gonna be ergonomic, you might as well go the full mile and delete everything that's not, you know, that's a stalk or something that sticks out, but I feel like an indicator stalk could just be left there because it, it would make life easier but i am getting used to it i have to say after a week with the car and then to drive it is just effortless it, you've got to get used to this sort of one pedal driving thing with electric cars on this one i've not found a way to adjust the severity of the regenerative braking but essentially the longer you keep your foot off the throttle the more braking input the car will give you. And the amount of times you ever need to use the brake pedal itself is very few and far between, because as I mentioned, if you hold your foot off the throttle for long enough, the braking sharpness sort of increases, increases, increases until you come to a stop. And you can fairly accurately judge it just intuitively straight away when you need to come off the throttle if say a set of traffic lights are coming up or a pedestrian crossing. And yeah, it's essentially you're, you're driving this thing with one foot 90% of the time. I think a car like this could really do with a heads up display because I can just imagine if it had that in front of me now, that would solve that issue. Because yeah, you do still find yourself peering over here to check what the speed limit is and what speed the car's doing. But I think a heads up display would eradicate that issue and make this almost perfect in terms of being able to just focus on the road. But let me tell you about something else which I think is quite good. And I really honestly wasn't expecting this. So when you start to push on a little bit, it's really jolly impressive. The steering is nice. <laughs> as I mentioned, I like to have it in the lightest of settings, but even then, as you speed up, there's a lovely weight to it. And although you don't feel connected to the wheels and you're not in any way, it's all fly by wire, it does have a good way of communicating with you. And you know, not like something with hydraulic steering, but you know what's going on and it is actually therefore quite a fun thing to start bashing down a country road like this. So yeah, we'll put our foot down now at 38, 39, 40 miles an hour wait until it flattens out. We'll do 40 to 60 and bosh. There is 60 miles an hour. So I would say this rear wheel driver of 5.8 to 60 sort of uh, ballpark is fast enough. As I mentioned, I think the long range is probably the car to go for mainly because of the additional range, but it is then ever so slightly faster. But I don't ever find myself wanting for more power with this thing. It's perfectly good enough. But yeah, I'm bashing along here at 60 miles an hour on this country road. This is a pretty unpleasant road in terms of its surface and it has quite a few cambers and tight corners. And this thing is genuinely quite a fun thing to thread down here. 
you only start to feel the weight of the thing when you go from say a left hand camber to a right hand camber very quickly or over a slight crest and you can feel the car move around slightly on its wheels and then you realize oh yes i'm in a quite heavy electric tesla but even then these things are well under two tons which by electric car standards is pretty light and yeah although in these brutally honest reviews i normally have a few brutally honest things to say about the cars in this one i'm really struggling i i really i really think this thing is fantastic i'm not trying to be positive about electric cars in the same way i'm not trying to be negative about them I, i'm sort of indifferent on the subject i think they're fascinating i still don't get me wrong always would choose something naturally aspirated and noisy and smelly for a, a sunday afternoon drive but i mean as a day-to-day -to -day, a to b utensil at all for getting you where you want to go and i'm finding it really hard to 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 pick fault with this um yeah <laughs> I mean, it's 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 absolutely it's absolutely fantastic. It really is. It, it drives dynamically quite well. I love the steering. I think it it's really nicely judged. It stops relatively well. Of course, I'm just driving it on the road. I'm not taking it on track. I'm not really pushing the brakes ever. But I've not had any issues with brake fade or feeling the weight under braking. I find that once you've set everything up, you don't really need to interact with this screen most of it is all that gimmicky stuff that you can only do when you're stopped and when it comes to the climate control as you can see it is really easy to adjust on here and you've also got this scroll wheel that you can use for it too if you just want to change where the direction of the air is going for example it's just a simple drag like that and i can point it straight at my face the sat nav one tap here you can see everything going on you can hit navigate and yes this typing away here trying to choose a destination whilst you're driving no not good but i wouldn't do that with my apple carplay either you'd want to pull over so i'm struggling to see any issue with this i mentioned i would like a head-up display that would be good because then i'm not constantly glancing down here away from the road for my speed it would be more like a conventional car where you just look in front of you but yeah i mean oh yeah it, it's really good it is really really good it's great to drive it's very comfortable it's inexpensive considering all of the quirks the perks the features you get you've got a heated wheel you've got double glazing you've got cooled seats heated seats front and rear and not only that if i use my 7.3 kilowatt home charger which i have to admit i've not been able to figure it out fully yet if i use that and charge it on the overnight tariff it's seven pence per kilowatt hour and this at 58 or so kilowatts it's about four pound 50 to charge it from zero to 100. tell me if i got that wrong but I, I did some calculations before and it was really cheap and that would get me reliably 250 miles and if i'm just to compare that now to my porsche kn which obviously there's no comparison between the two cars but the porsche kn is my current daily driver that would cost me to get 250 miles that's about half a tank on that so that's 75 quid so 75 pounds in my porsche to get 250 miles of range or about a fiver in this thing it, it genuinely has made me think oh my goodness maybe i should should get one of these because that kn i'm just using it for you know business mileage and when it's that cheap i mean it's sort of hard to fathom why you wouldn't have one okay but one thing i haven't tried yet in my week with the car and i think i'll just try it now i'll just put it to the test is we'll try and find a tesla supercharger and let's just say i've got five percent of battery for whatever reason i've not planned things very well it's all gone wrong i just need some charge let's see if i can find one easily and just go to it and use it let's see so i'm just going to use the voice recognition here which is pretty good actually take me to a supercharger so the nearest tesla supercharger is 1.5 miles away let's go there okay so we're going to do a ue at this roundabout and we can see it's already started preconditioning the battery for fast charging which is something that this does so as soon as you plug it in it's ready to receive 
all of that power. It's not sort of unexpected. I haven't done any sort of setup apart from I have the car registered on my phone. So I'm hoping ultra fast charging, but that's not Tesla. Ah, I see some other Tesla people, but this makes it really embarrassing and awkward because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm actually so, I actually don't know how to do this. I feel really, here we go, right. I'm gonna reverse it in to this one and let's see if this works. Right, so the port has closed itself. There we go, I've just reopened it because it thought I was taking too long, fair enough. Yeah, hello. There's a Tesla man watching me. It's the first time I've ever charged a Tesla. Charge port latch not engaged. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> that is quite good that you can just literally turn up and plug it in. You don't have to faff about with any apps or screens or anything like that. Okay, so thanks to help from the Tesla guy that happened to just be here. He's from Tesla Guildford as well, which is where this car was picked up from. What are the chances of that? Um, it just needed a, a proper shove in. I was doing it wrong. But yeah, I've turned up, I've plugged it in and fair play, it's working. It was already on about 80%, so it's only charging now. It's on 92%, it's only charging at 62 kilowatts an hour. But it is capable, like I say, of 170 if, uh, if the battery is, is lower. Genuinely, again, this is probably the best public charging experience I've, I've ever had. And uh, I thought I might be able to fault the car on this experience but no it's it's done this sublimely as well so <laughs> it, it's this i mean it's great it is this is great right so with that then i'm going to end this review and yeah i mean i really don't have all that much bad to say about this car it's honestly the week i've had it i've approached it with zero sort of expectation or prejudice and Everything has been fantastic. The only issue I've actually had is with my, my personal home charger. Moved into a new build recently and I've just not been able to set that up. But I've been charging this car overnight just on a three pin, which charges it about two kilowatts. But because it's such a small battery, you can get 100 miles of range or so overnight. So it's actually not been a problem for me. And yeah, I genuinely just pulled up to this Tesla supercharger and uh, there happened to be a Tesla man here who's sat in the car next to me who was very useful and helped me but I just wasn't plugging it in properly so it essentially just worked as soon as I turned up and um, there's plenty of chargers available which is also good but yeah from the driving experience to the comfort levels to the value for money yeah I mean I think it's I think it's super super good now don't get me wrong I'm a petrol head and there's no way I would ever just have a Tesla and nothing else. That's fine, but also that's a luxury. So for me, you know, I would certainly consider one of these now as my daily driver for doing my video reviews for getting from A to B. And I would always have something fun in the garage, 100%. I'm not trying to say that this is the future of motoring and we should all buy and use Teslas and nothing else. That's not at all what I'm, I'm getting at. But yeah, I mean, as, as a car, as a tool, as an A to B wagon, um, it's, it's fantastic, this. So thank you, Tesla, for allowing me to have a week with this car. I'm now obviously extremely keen to try out the other variants of Model 3, but also some of the other models as well. And I think, <laughs> All, honestly not that much I would improve I'd, I'd put in a heads up display and and that's more or less it so um, yeah thank you all so much for watching and I hope I'll see you again in the next one very very soon